John, you've called the problem of free will, this persistent problem, what is free will, something of a scandal mm -hmm. in philosophy. Why? Well, we haven't made any progress. Uh, I can't see that um, we have made an advance in the past, let's say, 100 years or even a couple of hundred years uh, over what went on in the previous history of philosophy. And, and most areas of philosophy, I think, in philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, uh, uh, we're definitely in better shape than our great-grandparents were. But I don't think that's true where the problem of free will is concerned. It's the same issues, the same mistakes being repeated over and over. This is fascinating. So let's try to really understand why there's a problem of yeah. free will. Because if I think about it, my volitional consciousness, I, I, I think, is, is, is quite uh, obvious. So, some would say it's mm -hmm. an illusion. Yeah. The reason that we have a special problem about free will, and this is typical of a lot of philosophical problems, is that we have inconsistent views, each of which is supported by what are apparently overwhelming reasons. The reason for believing that we have free will is we experience it every day. I mean, I decide to raise my arm and, and I, it makes my arm go up. I, but if I hadn't decided, my arm wouldn't have gone up. It was up to me. I could have raised my left arm or raised neither arm. We have the experience of conscious, rational decision-making, and we have the experience that the decisions were not themselves forced by antecedently sufficient causal conditions. You can see that if you contrast this case where I voluntarily decide to do something with a case where I'm in the grip of a powerful emotion or I'm an addict of some kind or I'm simply pushed in a certain direction. Or just some passiveness of having yeah. visual things, that's the right. perception. The, I mean, it's very passive. Where the causes are sufficient to produce the effect. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the reason that we think we have free will. Okay. But I'm on the other side, you've got an overwhelming amount of evidence that everything that happens has a cause, has an explanation in terms of causally sufficient conditions. I mean, if some somebody said, well, why was the, did the Oakland freeway collapse? We can tell you a story that will show you exactly why it had to collapse, why the causes were sufficient to force the collapse. And we don't see any reason to suppose that's not generally true, that as far as we know, uh, human behavior is part of the natural world, and it looks like it ought to be explained in terms of causally sufficient conditions. But if that's true, that everything has causally sufficient conditions, that we're completely uh, at the mercy of causal forces, then free will is an illusion. So we have two inconsistent views. The experience of free will gives us the conviction of free will, and the a uh, general knowledge about how the world works gives us a conviction of determinism. Now, if we start there, I can understand how some people would say, is, okay, I have the absolute certainty that I know uh, from a sequence of, of causes why the earthquake caused the bridge to collapse. Yeah. I can trace it. I can trace it forces, molecularly. Yeah. If, I, if I knew every molecule and everything on it, it would be instantly predictable. Yeah. And if that's the way the physical world works, that's completely consistent. Human beings are in the physical world, our brain in the physical yeah. world, so it's all that way. So then I would say, now I feel like I have free will, but, but our, our, uh, our uh, uh, perceptions are sometimes, sometimes illusory. We sometimes make mistakes. Right. Here's the difference between free will and other illusions. In the case of other illusions, you can live your life in the knowledge that it is just an illusion. There are standard optical illusions. Sure. And you live your life on the assumption that the two lines are the same length, even <laughs> though they look different lengths sure. in the Muller-Lyer illusion. But where it comes to free will, you can't live your life on the assumption of determinism. You go into the restaurant, and the waiter says, do you want the veal or the steak? Mm -hmm. You can't say, I'm a determinist. Mm -hmm. Que sera, sera. I'll just wait and see what happens. Because, and this is the point, if you do that, if you refuse to exercise free will, that, is free. that <laughs> refusal <laughs> is intelligible to you only as an exercise of free, free will. will. Sure. Now, Kant pointed this out. We can't shake off the conviction of free will. This doesn't show that it's true. I mean, it could be completely false. It could be a massive illusion. If so, the biggest illusion that biology ever, uh, that evolutionary biology ever played on us, because we live our life on the assumption of freedom, we can't get out of that assumption, and yet, for all we know, it might be false. We might be completely determined. And that would make that evolutionary a product be a, an incredible uh, waste or, 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 yeah. or an effort being done to create that when it would be irrelevant for... Totally for, for, irrelevant. Yeah. Yes. Now, this isn't... Well, the only thing that inclines me to think, well, maybe there is some evolutionary basis for free will, is that I, we don't know of any other 
part of evolutionary biology where you have such an expensive phenotype as conscious, rational decision-making. Mm -hmm. We devote an enormous amount of resources to teach our children how to do it. And just uh, in a crude biology, an awful lot of blood has to go to the brain right, right, right. in order to sustain this yeah. mechanism. And to be told, well, it doesn't have any evolutionary function, it's a massive illusion, it doesn't do anything for you, that's hardly a compelling argument that it's not so, but it certainly would make it some, something unusual as evolutionary biology goes, that we'd have this expensive mechanism for conscious, rational decision-making, and it's all useless. It's so, so all phenomenal. We have these two uh, 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 pillars of information, each one yeah. self-consistent, yeah. each one exceedingly b based upon enormous amounts of information that the physical world, every event has a cause in the physical world, right. and our sense of, of, uh, of, of free will, volitional free will, different than perceptual free will, the evolutionary cost, and they are absolutely incompatible with yes, each other. Yes, not only incompatible, but, but it's hard to see how we could give up on either of them. See, normally when you get to incompatible things like this, yes. you just give up on one. But I don't see how we can give up on either of these, and there are various possibilities that I can canvas. Now, I should tell you, most philosophers think this problem's been solved. Uh, they've been solved by something they call compatibilism, which says, <laughs> well, really, if you understand how the, what these words mean, you'll see that free will and determinism are really compatible. To say that you have freedom is just to say you're determined by certain sorts of causes, such as your desires, instead of somebody putting a gun at your head. I just think that's a cop-out. That compatibilism just evades the problem. The problem yes. can be stated without using these words. The problem is, is it the case for every decision that I make that the causes, the antecedent causes of that decision were sufficient to determine that very decision? Because if they are... We have no free will. And it's an illusion. That's right. It's an illusion. And if they're not, if there are some acts where I, we are capable of, uh, of acting making a rational decision making where the antecedent conditions are not causally sufficient, then we have at least the possibility of free will. Okay, so you, you've characterized these positions as gaps. Yeah. There, there has to be some sort of a gap between an antecedent cause yeah. that, that, that makes it sufficient to go forward. There has to be a gap where I can participate right. in that gap. There is a, there is, we, there's an experience gap. We do experience this gap every day. You decide, who am I going to vote for in the next election? Now, you don't just sit back and wait to see something happen. You actually have to think it through mm -hmm. and make up your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I'm calling the gap, the conscious experience that the reasons that you had for an action, though they're rationally the basis for an action, they don't typically compel the action. Yes, I did like this feature of that candidate, and I did like this other feature of that other candidate, but I voted for this guy, but I could have voted for that person equally well. I wasn't compelled or forced. And the argument has to maintain that that whole thinking was not some complex derivative of previous events. Yeah. Well, they, you see, here is the, the puzzling feature. Uh, as far as our conscious experiences are concerned, it seems to me our conscious reasons, the, the level of the mental, is not causally sufficient to force the next. I mean, you can see that by contrasting the cases where it is, where you really are in the grip of an mm -hmm. obsession, with the cases where it isn't. But the tougher question is, is what about at the level of the neurobiology? If the neurobiological level is causally sufficient to determine your behavior, then the fact that you have the experience of freedom at the higher level is really irrelevant.